I have a friend, his name is Jim Knackle. Jim was a very good, close friend for many years when I lived in uh, Michigan. He was a deacon in our church. He was someone who encouraged me in many different ways spiritually. Uh, one of the ways was um, we started memorizing scripture together, and it was actually at his, his uh, um, kind of impetus that we started doing that. We would meet uh, once a week on Tuesdays, memorize scripture together, pray a little bit, encourage each other in the Lord. And uh, I'm very thankful for his friendship. We got to see him not too long ago. But my friend Jim is someone, as someone who, who loved the Lord, he uh, at, at one point in his life realized that the Lord was calling him to something more than what was going on in his life. He uh, was part owner of a bike shop, uh, a high-end bike shop. In fact, he would get uh, some of the Red Wings and some of the Pistons players would come in from time to time and buy um, high-end uh, bicycles, Trek bikes or other bikes from, from his shop. And uh, it, was, it was successful, things were going well with that. But he realized that the Lord was calling him to something else. And so um, after a little while of making sure that he, the Lord was actually, you know, this was clear that this is what the Lord wanted him to do, he went to his brother, who was the other owner of the bike shop, and said, look, um, Lord's calling me to, to ministry. And so they sold the bike shop. Jim had uh, um, realized that the Lord was calling him to the mission field. And so as they sold the bike shop, he started working for an electrician as he was preparing to go on deputation, as he started going on deputation on the weekends. And Jim was a faithful witness. And as time went along, he started to get a little, into a little trouble for it. Um, as a contractor, he was with different uh, people that were working. Um, some of the men that he was working with weren't excited about being told about the Lord on break time. And they complained a little bit to his boss. And his boss went to him and said, look, you're going to have to stop talking about the Lord. You just can't do that. And he said, I'm not, I'm not taking any time away from you. I'm only doing it on my own free time and on break time. And he said, no, you can't do that either. And so Jim said, well, I know this is what the Lord wants me to do. And, you know, and, and he ended up losing his job. Here's a man who's serving the Lord, he's, on the, he's getting ready to go to the mission field and cuts off every bit of support that he had. He was just getting started on deputation for the cause because he knew that this is what the Lord wanted him to do. Some of you have faced things like that. Some of you have had to leave jobs because they were asking you to do things that were not right and you knew you could not do that and keep a clear conscience. Some of you are in circumstances where you have loved ones who are not saved, who don't understand a lick of what you're talking about when you talk about the Lord. And when you talk about the Lord, they're not open to it. In fact, it causes problems in your family gatherings. Someone even mentioned, asked for prayer this, this, uh, this morning in Sunday school for wisdom as they, as they go uh, to different family gatherings that they might be able to wit be a witness and it not be something that just causes all kinds of trouble. There's that side of things. Then there's other things where Christians go through difficult trials, things that they could never have seen coming, and you start to go through these things, whether it be a loss of a loved one, whether it be difficult uh, and maybe painful um, diseases or cancer, or it be relationships that are just excru excruciatingly difficult at job or at home, and you're suffering, and you know that God gives many different promises, and you look at some of the promises of God, and you, is this what's going on? And it's a normal thing for Christians to wonder, what is God doing in this situation? I'm serving the Lord, 
Is God trying to teach me something? Is it God punishing me? Does God like me? And these are questions that real Christians have. I want to take you, before we get into our passage in 1 Peter, I want to take you to Job chapter 16. As we look at this passage, I want to remind you that Job, we all know why Job was going through this. Satan basically asked God, you know, he, he pointed out Job and said, look, this guy won't stay for you if, if, if we take everything, if you, you know, if you allowed me to take everything away. He's going to run away from you. He's only yours because you've blessed him in so many ways. And God said, well, we'll prove it. And God gave Satan some real freedom to uh, bring much suffering upon uh, Job. And Job, in the midst of that, was feeling many of the things that real believers like you and like I sometimes feel in the midst of circumstances like that. Okay, Job was not suffering because he was doing good. I mean, he was not suffering because he was doing evil. He was suffering because he had done good. And look, look at how he is talking about this suffering after he gets done uh, kind of uh, telling his friends that they're not helping him very much, which they weren't. They were just piling on and blaming him for all the things he was going through. He says in verse 7, But now he, talking about God, hath made me weary. Thou hast made desolate all my company. And thou hast filled me with wrinkles, which is a witness against me. And my leanness rising up in me beareth witness to my face. He, talking about God, teareth me in his wrath, who hateth me. He gnasheth upon me with his teeth. Mine enemy sharpeneth his eyes upon me. They have gaped upon me with their mouth. They have smitten me on the cheek reproachfully. They have gathered themselves together against me. God hath delivered me to the ungodly and turned me over to the lands of the wicked. I was at ease, but he hath broken me asunder. He hath also taken me by the neck and shaken me to pieces and set me up for his mark. His archers, capital H, his archers, compass me around about. He cleaveth my reins asunder and doth not spare. He poureth out my gall on the ground. He breaketh me with breach upon breach. He runneth upon me like a giant. I have sewed sackcloth upon my skin and defiled my horn in the dust. My faith is foul with weeping and my eyelids is the shadow of death. Not for any injustice in my hands. Also my prayer is pure. Here... Job is just pouring out his heart. And he's starting in the midst of all these huge, terrible trials, which very few of us will ever come close to facing. He's starting to wonder, does God even like me? Is God against me? Is God fighting against me? And there's times when even believers face tough difficulties and start to ask those questions. You know, does God really like me? Does God really care about me? And the passage that, that was read earlier and that we're going to read right now is a passage that answers many of those questions. It's a passage that was intended to help believers who go through suffering. It's a passage not only prepared to help those who are going through suffering right now, but for believers who will go through suffering not who might go through suffering, but believers who will go through suffering. And if you'll look at it again, let's turn back to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. And let's look at this passage once more. God's word says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to trial you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody, in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God on his, this behalf. 
For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Here in this passage, Peter, through the inspiration of God, is doing two things for us. First of all, he's giving us some instructions. He's giving us instructions at how we need to go through times of suffering, how we even need to prepare for that. But also, he's giving us some much-needed truths. And as we go through this passage, I, I want you to see those. I have six commands that are found in this passage, as well as a number of truths that go along with those. And we want to start out, first of all, right there with the beginning. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. As we read this passage, I want to give you a little bit of background. Actually, it's maybe foreground. And I mean it by this. In the 80s, 70s, Nero came to power. And as a result of being pretty unpopular, he found a way to blame the burning of Rome on Christians and thus started an incredible persecution of Christians. Now, when we talk about that, that was in the future when this was written. That was just a few years in the future when this was written. God, under inspiration, was preparing his believers that Peter was writing to that this was going to come. Sometimes we read this and go, yeah, they were, they were under persecution. No, this was actually written before that started, that deep persecution started. But Peter was preparing them. And in this passage, one of the things that we need to re recognize as well, that Peter and God, through, uh, through Peter, is preparing us as well. This is why this passage is not just for those of you who are suffering right now, and some of you are suffering very deep things right now. This passage is for those who will suffer. And he says this, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. That, that word strange or think it not strange is very uh, interesting. In fact, it could be think, think it not surprising. Be, don't think it unusual. But the actual term there is a term that describes getting an unexpected visitor. Now, to us men, that probably doesn't mean as much of a, as much, you know, somebody comes to the door, ah, come on in. But probably many of you women can grasp this a little bit better, you know, that somebody comes to the door and you're, what, what's your first thought if you're not expecting them? Oh boy, <laughs> run around, right? Yeah, you know, the guys at the, at the door may be answering the door and uh, mom's like supervising the troops trying to, you know, put everything away if, if you're not expecting them. There's something especially hard when we do not expect visitors. When we might be more open to that when we're prepared, it's much more hard when we don't expect them. And, and Peter here is saying, we need to expect trials. We need to expect suffering. We need to be prepared for it. He says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which will try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. This is not unusual. In fact, this is the norm for Christian life. And that's the, the first command and the first truth is don't be surprised when you suffer. That's the first command. The first truth is suffering is a normal part of Christian life. Now, I want to say that this kind of flies in the face sometimes of the thoughts that we have about being a Christian. Sometimes, whether we would say it out loud, the kind of feelings that we have about how it all works, we talk in ways, in fact, that, that sometimes really shows that our practical theology or the theology that we're practicing might not be the same as the theology we really believe. Because most of us would say, yes, Trials are a part of the normal Christian life. But we start thinking things like, 
because I'm a Christian, you know, God's going to bless me. And we think about those blessings in ways that aren't always the same way God looks at them. For example, we look at things like, you know, we got a promotion. Wow, the Lord blessed me. So does that mean that if we don't get a, 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 the promotion we're looking for, that God has not blessed you? That God is not blessing you? Are you in trouble? Has, have you been doing something wrong just because you didn't get that promotion? Or other things that, that are wonderful and, and are blessings. Sometimes we start thinking that if we don't get those, that we are not blessing. We tend to think uh, along lines of physical things as being the primary blessings that God has for us. And God has something much greater in mind for us than that next thing or that success here or there in different areas. That is eternal success with him in glory and growing us as Christians. And so we're not supposed to think it's strange. We're not supposed to be surprised when difficulties, when persecutions, when trials come our way, because God has plans for us, plans for our good. And we're going to look at that a little bit more. In verse 2, I'm sorry, in the second verse of our passage, verse 13, he goes beyond saying, don't just think it's strange. Now, that, that's one thing to say, okay, it's, you know, it's, okay, we're going to have suffering. The next thing's a lot a lot more challenging. He tells us what to do in response to those sufferings. And as you look at it, you go, wow. We think about our response to suffering. And we think, do I do that? But he says this, but rejoice. He tells us to rejoice. He commands us to rejoice in the midst of sufferings. But he tells us why we can. He tells us how we can as well. It says this, Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Okay, this isn't the kind of rejoicing that you go, All right, man, my car just got trashed in that accident. Okay, that's, that's great. You know, wonderful. You know, or, you, you know, I... There's so many ways that we have difficulties come in our lives. And it's not that we are supposed to rejoice that this difficult thing came into our lives all because of that difficult thing. When you lose a job, that's a difficult thing. It's a very difficult thing. When you have health problems or relational problems, those things are things that cause great pain. But in the midst of that pain and in the midst of that suffering, he doesn't say it's not suffering. He doesn't say that it's not difficult. He doesn't say it's not painful. He doesn't say that you won't feel at times like Job. But what he does say is there is light. There is hope. There is joy that you can look forward to. And so he says we can rejoice in that we're partakers of Christ's suffering. That idea of being partakers of Christ's suffering is that we are coming alongside the very things that Jesus Christ has done. When you think about that, Christ, Jesus Christ, came from heaven. He is God. He has never sinned. Lived in eternal harmony, wonderful harmony with God. And he came to earth. And from day one began suffering. He, his... Uh, his bed was a manger. He was rebuked by parents who were, in, who were fallible, sometimes wrongly. He had brothers and sisters that picked on him, and he didn't retaliate in the wrong way. He came to his earthly ministry and was over and over again made fun of, was uh, was. The many wrong things and, and false things were said about him. He was lied about. When it came to the time of his crucifixion, they had to bring false witnesses up against him, and they did. And they said all kinds of horrible things. They said he was blaspheming against the father that he loved. 
and Christ suffered the most horrible death anyone could die for us. One of the points that is being made here is that Christ suffered. Do we think that we shouldn't also have some sufferings? Do we deserve any better than, better than Christ? And that really is a key point that we need to remember. Because one of the things that will plague you at times when you're suffering is, why me? Why am I having to go through this? Do I deserve this? Did Christ deserve it? He didn't deserve it. We, anything we get, we deserve a lot more than he does. But Christ didn't. He's saying, Peter is saying that when we suffer, we actually partake of some of the sufferings that Christ did. Okay? So one of the points that he's making is that even as Christ suffered, we will suffer. And no one deserved it less than Christ. But he says also that when Christ's glory shall be revealed, when his glory shall be revealed, ye may also be glad also with exceeding joy. Just as Christ suffered, and the Bible says he did it for the joy that was set before him. What was that joy that was set before him? It was you. Those that would believe, that would be reconciled to his Father. For the joy that was set before him, he, he suffered the death on the cross. But here it says that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. One of the things that happens to us when we suffer is it's hard for us to have hope. And we know from this passage that we do know the end of the story. We don't know all the pieces in between. We don't know all the things that we're going to have to suffer. But we do know that one day God shall wipe away every tear and we will be able to rejoice with him with exceeding joy when we look back and see all that Christ has done on our behalf. That there is a joy that's made even more precious when we suffer. I've seen that. I remember in my first ministry, looking at some of the older folks in, in the church and hearing them talk about heaven. And I remember being, you know, rebuked. I mean, I'm like, man... I mean, I'm excited about heaven, but they are, they are like Israelites in the, in the Old Testament who are ready to cross over the Jordan. They're looking at that and excited about it. And many of you have that, that joy and that hope for heaven. And one of the things that has brought you to that is many of the things that you've suffered. You have sent others before you. You see the time coming, clear, coming closer and you're looking forward to and rejoicing that in that. And that's something really all of us need. We need a good sense of what the prize is that's before us, that we will have great rejoicing at the end of whatever we're facing. Passage goes on and says, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Now here, in this passage, he starts out generally talking about suffering, and he's going to get back to general suffering. But one of the examples he wants to use is persecution. And so he, he turns to that, he says, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. The word could also be translated blessed. It's the same word, the idea that you are blessed in the uh, uh, Beatitudes. Blessed are they that mourn, all right? Um, if ye um, re be, be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory in God resteth upon you. For, on, I mean, on their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. This is what happens when you are persecuted, when you might lose a job, or you have extra difficulties in your life, maybe with a neighbor or a friend who won't talk to you because they can't stand to hear about your Lord, or they can't stand the fact that you're different anymore. Or maybe down the road when we do suffer real persecution like other, every other country in the world has. But he says this, that when we're persecuted and we suffer that with joy, 
it points to the fact that you are a real believer. It points to the fact that God is in you. Many of you who, who have gone through many things already know that there is a joy and a peace that God gives you that you cannot explain in times of difficulty. Many of you have come through things and you're, you don't know how on earth you would ever go through that and not just give up. And God has given you the strength and God has given you help through those times of difficulty. And here he's saying that that very help that he gives you to carry through those difficult things is an evidence that God is in you. And it says this, on, your part, on their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Here in a time of persecution, people who are coming after you and trying to persecute you and hurt you because of your belief and your testimony for Christ, the Bible says, for his sake you're being hurt, but through your life you're glorifying God. So what happens is people don't like to hear the truth of God. In fact, in Romans it talks about how people want to push it away from them. So even as they're pushing it away from them, as maybe they may be persecuting you because they do not want to hear it, they're fighting against God. But your testimony, when you remain right with God and when you stay and be obedient to him in the midst of that, you are at the same time actually giving glory to God. They're trying to push down God and your testimony is lifting up God. God wants to be glorified among his people and you can be part of giving glory to him. In verse 15 it gives us some in important instructions and this would be the third command. The first one is don't be surprised. The second one is to rejoice. But the third one, this one's kind of a little bit more practical and it's don't act like a martyr, martyr when you suffer for your own faults. It says this, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other man's matters. It's funny, I, you, you look at this uh, progression, you see as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody. And, you know, I mean, I, I expected to see, you know, I mean, there's, there's some pretty bad ones out there that I, I just expected, you know, it's going to be, you know, something you, you'd get the death penalty for, or life in prison at least, and it's, it's, it's as a busybody. But let's, let's look at this list. You have those that might suffer as a murderer or as a thief. Sometimes there have been times in history when Christians have thought that being a Christian gave them the right to do some things that really it doesn't. You know, because we're a Christian, it doesn't mean we have the right to kill other people who aren't. And there have been things like crusades and things like that that have gone on in the name of bringing the kingdom of God in through force. That's not what he's talking about. Or as a thief or as an evildoer, that's the idea of someone who just continually is, is doing things that are, are against what's right. That's a very general term, as an evildoer. And then he gets to the, the term, even as a busybody. That's the idea of people that are constantly involved in everybody else's life in ways that are not necessarily welcome. Whether it be from talking about them, or being nosy, or, or, or uh, in, inserting yourself in ways that, that you weren't welcome. Sometimes we as Christians maybe can get in trouble with that. I mean, what, what might that look like? I mean, you know, certainly it can look like gossip and things like that, but in the, in the workplace, do we spend our time, it, it might even look like this, people are doing wrong. People are clearly doing wrong and going in the wrong direction in their life. What would be the first thing that we should be talking to them about? Should it be about that particular thing that they're doing wrong in their life? Or should it be the gospel? Sometimes we like to meddle and tell everybody else what they're supposed to do as Christians. And there, that may not, that may sometimes run into the realm of busybody. But when we're sharing the gospel, 
That's a whole different story. So we need to make sure that we're not being reproached for things that we deserved. And, you know, Christians are quick to do that. You know, when we're suffering, when, when people are after us, we want to find a good reason that makes us look good, don't we, sometimes? Makes us feel better about ourselves. Well, I'm just suffering for the Lord. I know I was speeding, but I was on my way to church. <laughs> there's all kinds of scenarios, and that's, that's a kind of a silly one. But there's all kinds of scenarios that we can put out there where we're quick to call it suffering for the Lord. We don't want to follow the county regulations, and so we start getting in trouble in our building program, which we didn't. We followed all the... We were very careful. But then we start blaming, you know, where it's just persecution because we... They're, they're trying to shut us down. Well, if we weren't trying to follow the regulations, then we can't just kind of claim it's persecution. There's lots of ways Christians, in many different ways in our, in our lives, we want to do this. We kind of want to give, us, give ourselves a pat on the back, even when we're kind of getting what we deserve. And so our third command here, third instruction, is make sure we don't act like a martyr when you suffer for your faults. Now, how do we avoid that? One of the things is we need to be examining our lives. When we suffer, we need to be looking and saying, did I deserve any of this? Is some of this just, just desserts? Even there, the Lord wants to use those things to teach us and grow us and make us more like him. So if those are the things that are getting us in trouble, God's using that even to purify us. Now, fourthly, in verse 16, our fourth instruction, the first one is don't be surprised, second rejoice, third is don't act like a martyr when you suffer for your faults, but fourthly, he tells us another thing that's very helpful. It says, don't be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. It's interesting how quickly we can fall into being ashamed. You know, I, it's interesting, uh, we've just come through a, a very long election cycle. And it's interesting how people who believe certain truths very strongly, when they might get out on a public stage and someone starts picking apart at, they start getting nervous and start getting ashamed about those things that they would, they clearly believe, but then in front of a different crowd they start getting ashamed. But how often does that happen to us? You know, we, we know we should share the gospel and Oh, it's, yeah, it's not going to go over well. We'll just kind of be quiet. When we suffer persecution, are we embarrassed? Oh, man, you know, I, you know, I got, I got, I, I ran into this, and we're, we're, we're so, we're, we're ashamed. We're, we, we start, we start believing the world's press. We start believing the unbeliever's opinion of us. And the Bible says we're supposed to instead, we're supposed to glorify God on this behalf. We need to make sure, we need to be very clear that we're suffering, if we're suffering for the cause of Christ, that we're suffering for the cause of Christ. But if we are, do not be ashamed. The Bible says, I'm, uh, I think it was Paul that said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. But we need to be careful that we're not ashamed. There's a good story in, in Acts about the disciples when they were imprisoned and the Sanhedrin got together and one of the Sanhedrin got up and said, look, let's not fight against these men. You know, some of them, you know, there's been all these different people who have kind of come and gone. If God's in it, it'll go. And if it's not, it'll just go away by itself. And so they beat them after they'd been in prison and sent them on their way. And the disciples' response was this. They rejoiced that they were worthy to suffer for Christ. That's a big different story from going home beaten and ashamed. And that's really the way we need to approach real persecution, that we are able to stand with our head high, as many you know, martyrs did. They stood in the flames and were willing to keep on talking about the Lord as their body was being burned. What an example to us. So, so fourthly, we're not supposed to be ashamed, and, and, and fifthly, we're supposed to glorify God. Let him glorify God on this behalf. We can rejoice that we are, we are doing this for the Lord. Now, verse 17 and 18, 
It says some difficult things, and we want to talk about that so you understand what's going on there. It says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, or it's very difficult for them to be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Now, this idea of judgment beginning at the house of God is kind of a difficult thing. But what, it, what he's saying is God is going to work to purify and to chasten his believers first. Judgment needs to begin at the house of God. So when we go through thing, times of suffering, sometimes we are being chastened. Sometimes we're just being purified. The, verse, the song that we sang second, uh, oh, rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistakes. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. You know where that came from? That came from the beginning of this, this very book. Where it talks about, in verse 7, 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, 7. That idea is, is uniquely biblical, that God will try us in different ways. He does it for the purpose of perfecting us as believers. He does it for the purpose of bringing us more and more into a stronger relationship with him. And that is a good thing. It's not an easy thing, but it's a good thing. But here's, here's what it says. It says, uh, judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? These trials that you go through are difficult but think of what the end is of those who are not going through them, those who are not being purified, those who are not God's people. The trials you face are for a season. The trials they, see, they face are for eternity. The Bible talks about a real place called hell where, where those who are unbelievers will be cast. Not that he created it for them. He created it for the devil. But, he had to create, but, but those who follow the devil and who do not believe will have their place there with the devil as well. And it says, And if the righteous scarcely are, it's very difficult for them to be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? This carries on that same, that same um, train of thought. What does it mean, though, if it's very, that the righteous scarcely can be saved, or it's very difficult for them to be saved? That's kind of a weird phrase. You're not quite sure exactly what it's talking about. And as you look at it, it's, it's like you're just barely getting saved. Here's what it's talking about. It's really talking about how difficult it was. How difficult was it for you to be saved? Now you're thinking about what you've done to be saved right now. Think about how difficult it was for you to be saved and what Christ had to do for your salvation. How difficult was it for you to be saved? Think about the hours of agony on the cross as Christ struggled just to take a breath. Think about him in the garden with drops of blood coming from his sweat pores because he's in such fear and trembling about the cross something that he knew he needed to go to. He did it out of love for us. But the tension that was there, the pressure, the stress that was on him, it was very difficult for you to be saved. Thankfully, we didn't have to do that. Thankfully, we didn't have to try and work for ourselves because it is impossible. And that's what the point of this, this verse 18 is, that if the righteous, it fits very hard for the righteous to be saved, Think of where the ungodly and the sinners will be. It was a difficult path that brought us to salvation, but it's an impossible path that will bring them to damnation. And so we have much to rejoice in even in that, that Christ paid the price for our sins. And verse 19, I love this, this last verse. It's such a beautiful verse. It's, it's one that we need to keep in our hearts and minds. And it ties it all together, both general suffering and suffering for the cause of Christ. It says, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God 
commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. The last instruction that, that Peter is giving to us, that God is giving to us through Peter, is that we need to commit our souls to God in times of suffering. That looks a little bit like us seeing this thing that we're going through and saying, Lord, you have allowed this to come into my life. You are in control. I know that you love me. I know that you're going to be faithful to me. I don't have any idea how this is all going to work out. But it's in your hands. And I'm going to trust you. Them that suffer according to the will of God. Do you know that your suffering is according to the will of God? And that he's also a faithful creator? Believer, that he loves you and he's allowing this because he loves you. And one day you will be brought to a much better place where you'll see all the, the joys that are a result of it. Christians, when we suffer, we can't afford to suffer on our own. We can't afford to suffer and just look at it as the world looks at it. We need to look at it differently. We need to see that God is in it. We need to run to him when we suffer. We need to trust him. We need to talk to him even as Job did and as David did in many of the Psalms and pour out those difficulties and those questions to him rather than just doing about them in our own minds. And God will show himself faithful. God will help you through that. This, this very middle section where it's talking about how our response, that we're happy, yeah, happy are we that the spirit of glory in God resteth upon you, is such a wonderful thing that we know that when we're believers, God will bring us through those things he will help us to be able to even have peace and joy. And he will prove that we are believers through those things. What a joy it is to know that he is on the throne. Let's pray.